Um, first of all, good afternoon to everybody, or any any and or good morning in the case of uh, Walter, early morning in Calgary. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Walter again, uh, Walter again for being uh, able to to join us. is uh, It's always a pleasure and it's an honor to have Walter Herzog. Uh, talking in, uh, in the Sports Sciences Conference of the FMH, of the Faculty of Human, Movement, uh, of Human Kinetics. Uh, we were just re remembering that uh, the first time Walter came to the faculty was in 2008 um, for the European College of Sports Sciences when we organized it at that time. And since then, he was a regular visit to, to the faculty and to our biomechanics lab, uh, always with a great commitment and, and fantastic presentations and courses. Uh, it's, it's really a, a pleasure always for, for, for us and for our group to, to uh, be present in, in, in Walter's conferences. Um, I think uh, for the presentation, uh, everybody knows that Falter is one of the top researchers in, uh, in muscle mechanics, uh, not only in the field of, of uh, sports biomechanics, but in biomechanics in general. And even in, and, and it's one of the researchers that uh, covers from macro, a macro approach to movement science to, to, to molecular and even uh, extremely uh, small, uh, detailed, and, and, and basic. Um, uh, I think that some of the works were even below molecular level. Uh, and so it's, a, it's a, a fantastic experience to have you uh, talk about uh, basic muscle mechanics and, and particularly their applications to sports. So with uh, not taking more time, I would like I would like to invite Walter Herzog to start this presentation. Uh, Antonio, I think, yeah. Did you want to say something else? <laughs> no, 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 no. So please, please take the yeah. floor. Thank, thank you very much for the, for the kind invitation, Antonio, and also to Duarte and, and, and Pedro for the invitation to the, to the symposium here. It's always a great pleasure uh, to be there. And of course, I'd love to be in Portugal uh, in, in person, that would be a lot more fun. And as Antonio mentioned, I've been there several times. It's always been very good. So I'll be, I'm, I was tasked to talk a little bit about basic muscle mechanics and uh, as it applies to sport. And I'm always a bit worried when I do that because, um, because I, I really don't consider myself a sport biomechanist and I've never really had any funding or applied for any funding for sport biomechanics. But then naturally, out of basic muscle mechanics, there's very often questions that are really well answered using sport applications. And I think sport very often can help you, particularly in the human environment, to help you solve some very basic problems. And hopefully, I can give you with some examples a little bit an idea about how that might be working. And so the way I structure my lecture today is that I talk a little bit about uh, the basics, that means, you know, structure of muscle and the cross bridge theory. And the reason why I do that is because I know not all of you are muscle mechanics people and just to bring everybody up uh, to a similar level and a similar understanding. And then I talk about what most people will consider the two most basic properties of skeletal muscle, the force length relationship and the force velocity relationship. And we'll try to show some examples directly from sport how knowledge of the force lengths or the force velocity relationship might actually be of great advantage to understand the sport movement or even to enhance the performance of an athlete. So let's get started with uh, the basic muscle structure, just that we know what we are talking about. So all of you know that we have muscles in our arms and limbs and everywhere in the body. And then these muscles are made up of uh, smaller components that we like to identify because we can work on all these components mechanically and with our research. And so the next smaller component for an entire muscle is a fascicle, which is enveloped by some connective tissue and contains typically 
in about big muscle, hundreds and thousands of individual muscle fibers. And then the smaller unit here is a muscle fiber, which is a long multinucleated cell in skeletal muscle. And uh, muscle fiber then contains these uh, contractile organelles called myofibrils. And in a normal human fiber, you'll have about 2,000 to 5,000 of these myofibrils. And the myofibril is characterized by having sarcomeres in series. So you have one sarcomere after the other. You don't have sarcomeres in parallel. And the good thing about myofibrils is, and that's why we like to work with them, is because I can measure the force at the end of a myofibril. And I know, because all sarcomeres are in series, I know that all sarcomeres carry exactly the same amount of force. And in a myofibril, it's very easy to also measure the individual sarcomere lengths. And so I know how long each sarcomere is, with, with what speed does it shorten, and so on. So I can get a really good characterization of the mechanics of individual sarcomeres. And then, of course, the sarcomere shown here, bounded by the connective tissue Z lines here. And then you have the, um, the uh, actin filaments emanating from the Z lines. And in the middle of the sarcomere, you have the other contractile protein, the myosin. So most of us think of a sarcomere with the two contractile proteins, actin and myosin. And that's also how we think about muscle contraction. So here we have a, a myofibril that we have used for our, one of our experiments. And you see that typical striation pattern with the dark bands here representing the myosin uh, filaments and then the lighter band representing the actin filaments that give this striated appearance. And here you have a sarcomere under an electron microscope with the um, Z band here, the myosin filament in dark here, and then here the Z band halves the actin filaments that go to this uh, sarcomere and then also to the next one that is not shown in this, in this particular image. So um, a newer development has been that in the last 20 years or so, we recognized that uh, maybe sarcomeres are not well represented with just the contractile filaments actin and myosin, but that there is this third filament, titan, that plays a major role in passive force and also in active force regulation, we think, and many other people think as well. And of course, titan is the structural protein that attaches here to the M line, is fixed onto the myosin filament, and then runs freely like a molecular spring along the actin filaments and then attaches here at the end to the actin filament and enters the Z line with the actin, uh, with the actin filament. And so Titan plays a, a crucial role, we think, in many aspects of force production and the properties of muscle. But today, I will not be talking about Titan uh, specifically. The other thing to realize is that muscles, of course, come in a variety of different shapes and forms. And here are some of these forms shown. So here we have a parallel fibered muscle or a fusiform muscle. And these two muscles are characterized by a direction of the fiber that's along the longitudinal axis of the muscle. Whereas in other muscles like that we call pennate muscles, for example, here, we have a distinct difference in the direction of the fibers relative to the long axis of the muscle. So here the fibers go away from the long axis, and this is the long axis of the muscle. And then when you have two of these distinct fiber directions, then we call it a bipennate muscle, like for example, the rectus femoris, and you have multiple or more than two of these distinct fiber directions, then we call it a multipennate muscle. And for, for example, the deltoid muscles in the, in the human body. And then you ask yourself, well, why would you have these different arrangements of the, of the muscles? And what's the advantage or disadvantage of them? And so for that, imagine, for example, that you have a parallel fiber muscle and a unipennate muscle of equal volume. So in the parallel muscle, you have long fibers that go all along the muscle. So they take up more volume because they are long. And here you have shorter fibers that take up less volume. So they are not as long, but you can put more of them in parallel. And then when I show that schematically here, then we have the pennate muscle with the short fibers, where we have a lot of fibers in, in, in parallel, uh, so a big cross-sectional area. And here we have the 
and the fusiform or the, or the parallel fiber muscle is the long fibers and the smaller cross-sectional area with equal volume, then of course the peak force, the peak isometric force is higher in the pink muscle here in muscle number one because the peak force relates to the physiological cross-sectional area. Whereas uh, here we have the longer fibers and the long fibers relate to the excursion shown here. So this muscle would have a bigger excursion than, than, the, the, than the pink muscle. So the advantage of the parallel, parallel fiber muscle is that it has a long excursion and of the penny muscle is that it has a bigger force. And then you can say, well, what about the work capacity? And the work capacity we can measure by the area under the curve and the work capacity is the same in these two muscles because the work capacity relates directly to the volume of the two muscles. So the pennate muscle is strong, but has a little excursion, but the work capacity of both of them is about the same. And that's important to know when we are considering which muscles or muscle groups we are working with, for example, in an athlete or in a working situation. So how do muscles now uh, contract and here I will very briefly just go through the basics of the cross bridge theory so that we understand how that works. So in 1953 and 1954, Andrew Huxley and Hugh Huxley, uh, you know, discovered that uh, we have contraction of muscles and shortening of muscles through the sliding of the actin relative to the myosin filaments, as shown in this little anim animation here uh, schematically. And uh, the way this sliding occurs uh, then was later on described by, by Andrew Huxley. But before the sliding filament theory, I think it's important to realize that people thought that the myosin filament would be shortening, thereby producing force, and thereby also allowing for the shortening of a muscle. We are certain now that that is not correct and that it is indeed a sliding of the actin versus the myosin filaments. But how does this sliding occur? Well, in 1957, uh, Andrew Huxley, who is shown here with his wife, Regenda, in 1999, when they came to attend a couple of conferences in Calgary, he wrote this beautiful paper on how he thought uh, the sliding of the actin versus the relative to the myosin film would be occurring. And the way he imagined that is that he thought there might be these side pieces that we now call cross bridges that emanate from the myosin filament and that we have on the actin filament specific uh, sites labeled A here where these cross bridges can attach. And when they attach there, then they can pull through some force the actin past the myosin filament. And this is shown uh, here with uh, Ron Milligan's uh, um, an animation of a, of a cross bridge where you have the myosin filament here, you have an elastic connector from the myosin filament to the two cross bridge heads. Here you have the actin filament, and then you see how the um, myosin head attaches to the actin filament, and then through a rotation of part of the myosin cross bridge head, this part that's right now, uh, we, uh, we get this movement of the actin past the myosin filament, and we know that this is all driven by the hydrolysis of adenosine three phosphate or ATP, and in a typical cross bridge cycle, we think that one ATP is used per cross bridge cycle. And so that's how we imagine this uh, active force production in muscle is occurring. And here I'm just showing a, a very simple steady state equation that you find in most physiology textbooks. And the reason why I want to show this is not to explain the mathematics behind the cross bridge theory, but what, what I want to make sure is that the cross bridge theory is not just a cartoon representation or an animation that I showed you in the previous slide, but it's actually uh, expressed in, in mathematical terms. And so you can take a muscle and put in the right parameters and say what you're doing with the muscle, for example, you stretch it or you shorten it, and then you can get a response from your mathematical model that you can then can test against an experiment that you are performing. So I think it's very important to realize that this is not just a cartoon, but it's a mathematical formulation, a strict formulated mathematical formulation that is based on multiple assumptions that are not necessarily trivial, 
but, uh, but you can use this particular approach to test your experimental results. So with that in mind, let's go to the first property that I want to talk about, and that is the force length relationship. So here we have such a force length relationship. So here we have the force on the vertical axis and uh, length of the muscle, or in this particular case, the sarcomere length as expressed by Gordon Huxley and Julian in 1966. So we have this length of the muscle. And then as we see, the muscle is strong here in some intermediate lengths. And then when it gets shorter, it becomes weaker. And when it gets longer, it becomes weaker as well, to the point where we have zero force at very long and zero force at very short lengths, and then a great force here in between. And so how is this all regulated and how does this fit into the cross bridge theory? Well, the way it fits is that we think that especially the plateau and the descending limb can be explained with the actin myosin filament overlap. So for example, if we start here at the end where we have no force, that means actin and myosin filaments are not overlapping. So the cross bridge is shown here schematically cannot interact with the actin filament because the actin filament is not in their neighborhood and they cannot reach that far. And therefore you cannot produce any active force. If you now shorten the muscle and therefore the sarcomere, then this overlap between actin and myosin will increase linearly and also linearly will increase the number of cross bridges that become available for interacting with the actin filaments. And then when you hear a position B shown here, then you have a maximum overlap of actin and myosin and all cross bridges potentially can interact with the actin filament. And that's when you get a maximum amount of force. And then if you short a little bit more, then we have this plateau. There is no increase in force despite an increase in overlap. There's no increase in force because we know that in about 0.2 microns in the middle of the myosin filament, we don't have any cross bridges. So even though you have more overlap between actin and myosin, there is actually no corresponding increase in the number of, uh, in the number of cross bridges that can interact with one another. And so that's kind of the classic force length relationship of a sarcomere. And in an entire muscle, this looks a bit different. So here we have a force length relationship of an entire muscle. It's more rounded, first of all, so we don't get these distinct corners, and that is likely due to the fact that sarcomeres in a muscle and fibers in a muscle are not uniform, and so there is a certain smoothing of this curve. The second thing to observe here is that we don't reach the zero force here or here in this particular muscle, the vastus lateralis, because within the constraints of the human body or the animal body, very often we don't get to the end length, the shortening or the lengthening that gives us zero force, but you work in some intermediate area of the force length relationship. And then the other thing to realize, which I always think is very important, and people often neglect that, particularly in theoretical modeling, is that when you activate the muscle at submaximal levels, then the force length relationship changes in shape. So here, this is the maximum activation, and typically we think of the force length relationship as a relationship obtained under maximal activation levels. But then when we go to lower levels, 50% here or 30% here or 10% here, you can see that the shape of the force length relationship is distinctly different from the one that we obtain under maximal contraction. And it's something to keep in mind. And it's something that we think is fairly well understood, but that I'm not gonna talk about today why we have this change in shape when a muscle is activated so maximally compared to maximally. If you now go to sport applications, well, in sport, of course, when you have a muscle or a muscle group is a force length relationship, that's where you would like to work. You would like to work at the optimal lengths where you have a maximum force capacity. You don't want to be at short lengths where you have little force, and you don't want to be at the long lengths where you have little force. And so you can then test in a variety of different sports, for example, what is the working range within the force length or the torque angle relationship? And we have done that for a variety of different sports. And my favorite one to show here is uh, on cycling. And so one of the questions we had at one point is whether or not cyclists use muscles. And this is the knee extensor muscles in this particular case. 
in the optimal way according to the force length relationship. And so we had uh, 15 cyclists that we took and we measured the torque angle and the force length relationship of the knee extensor muscles. We measured the electromyographic activity. We did a superimposed twitch technique to ensure that the muscles were maximally activated. And we had an ultrasound probe to measure the fascicle lengths in this particular case for the vastus lateralis muscle. And then we had the people go onto a bicycle ergometer and adjust the seat in any way they wanted. It was completely left up to them. And then we measured the fascicle length changes in the vastus lateralis as they were pedaling. And then we get this type of a change in fascicle lengths that we can determine. And we were particularly interested in terminal fascicle lengths at the beginning of the power cycle here, and then at the end, so through the entire power phase, and see where, relative to the torque angle or force length relationship, this movement was occurring. And so here we have the normalized force on the vertical axis as a function of the normalized fascicle lengths from the vastus lateralis on the horizontal axis. And then the curve for these 15 people looked approximately like this, where you here see the variation in the fascicle lengths at the different uh, force levels. And here we had to extrapolate because we couldn't measure here. And so that's a, an extrapolation where the dashed line is. And now the question became, for example, at 80 revolutions per minute of cycling pedaling rate and the maximal effort where would the fascicle lengths be in the power phase of cycling? And here it is. So at the beginning of the power phase, this is indicated by the green line. So on average, the fascicles were at about 1.25 of the optimal lengths. And at the end, they were at about 0.9 of the optimal lengths. And as you can see, this en envelopes really nicely the uh, maximum force producing ability and therefore, we can conclude that the cyclists, by adjusting the seat height in the way that they like to cycle, uh, did that in a manner that they took optimal advantage of the torque angle or the force length relationship. And as you know, uh, in cycling, that's really easy, easily done because if you have ever ridden on a bicycle that's, for example, too small for you and you're sitting too low, then you immediately realize that it takes much more effort to pedal. And one of the reasons is because you are in not a very good situation relative to the force length relationship of your muscles. And so by training and by trial and, and trial and error, well trained cyclists will figure out uh, where to sit so they can take advantage of the force length relationship. Here is an another functional force length relationship, and this is for the double polling action in cross country skiing. And so here we have somebody uh, pushing uh, against these poles on the force platform attached to a harness so that the person doesn't fall. And we put them into the different positions that correspond from zero to 100% of the polling cycle in double polling and cross country skiing. And we measured the force along the poles here. And when you do that, then you are very, very strong here at the beginning, that's the white trace. You're very strong at the beginning of the polling cycle and then you get very weak. So at the end, your force is only about 20% of the force that you have at the maximum level. <clears throat> so a big, big change in the isometric force, in the force that you have available, depending on the position of the polling cycle that you are. However, then you also calculated the propulsive force from the total force. And the propulsive force, of course, is the force that goes in the forward direction or parallel to the ground, so we take the projection from the pole angle onto the ground and calculate this component of the total force and call that the propulsive force. And interestingly enough here, you can see that this propulsive force stays relatively constant for most of the polling cycle. And that's really the case, of course, because here the poles are near vertical and then here they are near horizontal. And so in terms of the propulsive force, a bigger component of the total force becomes propulsive force as the percent of the stride cycle continues. And this is really important because very often people emphasize that to cross-country skiers that they are very strong at the beginning of the polling cycle. And that's really where they should focus and not really worry very much about the end of the cycle 
uh, because they are not very strong there and the skiers know that. However, the propulsive force is very strong because most of the total force becomes propulsive force. Whereas here only a small amount of the total force is propulsive force. And therefore my advice would be the cross country skier and has been that the end phase of the, of the polling cycle is very, very important because you get as much propulsion here than here, even though you feel that you're not very strong. But again, it's the mechanics that actually helps you and the pole orientation that helps you. So it's something to keep in mind. Another thing that we have done with the force length relationship is also the directionality of it, because it's not only the length of the muscles, but it's also the direction in which you have to apply the force. So imagine this is a pedal and the crank cycle, and we are cycling to the right here. So uh, the person is pushing in the power phase and we are at 30 degrees. We had 15 people, 15 cyclists do that. And the average force was about 400 Newtons, as you can see the scale here they are, uh, in, in this particular direction. And then we know, of course, that this is not perpendicular to the crank, but that the only force that produces a propulsion really and work in cycling is the tangential force here. So we calculated the tangential force shown here in white. And so we get this particular component. And now we ask these people to push only in this direction, in the, in the direction perpendicular to the crank, because many coaches, many athletes, many scientists even believe that this component here of the yellow force, this one that's along the crank, is a wasted component because it doesn't produce any work. And of course, mechanically speaking, that's absolutely correct. So you're really wasting this component of the yellow force and only the white force here is, is really of any use. However, if you ask people to push perpendicular crank, then a maximal effort as well, then the force is becoming much smaller. And why is that? Because the directionality of the force application di dictates what muscle synergies are available to you. And you cannot use all the major leg extensor muscles to produce this direction of a force. And since you cannot use all the muscles that are really important for cycling, it's very hard to get a big force here. So this is the maximum effort. So if I wanted to get that maximum effort with this yellow force, I only would need about one third or maximally half of the yellow force that I have in the unconstrained situation, in the situations how cyclists actually pull. And I can very easily reach that force Whereas if I try to push perpendicular, then it's very hard to reach that force. And then you can look at that in all the different uh, configurations during the, during the pedaling cycle, the propulsive phase. And you see that the white one is always longer than the red one. So the component of the normally applied force, the one that cyclists normally do, is always much bigger here. And here the white is bigger than the red. And here the white is bigger than the red. And here it's much bigger and here it's much bigger. And you also see that not only does the force depend on the direction, but it also depends on the position of the leg. So here the white force is good, but here it's longer and here it's bigger. And then it becomes smaller towards the end of the cycle again. And that's the force length relationship at work in conjunction with the directionality. We went even a little bit further and we asked people to push in a variety of directions. So what's the maximum force? perpendicular to crank and then, the, and then the real force that they normally would apply and then a variety of different directions. And then you get this envelope, this force envelope that shows not only is the force that you can exert on an instrument like a, like a pedal in cycling, it's not only dependent on the force length relationship and the configuration of your joint, but it depends absolutely crucially in what direction the force has to be applied. And in many situations, the power phase applying the first per force perpendicular to the crank is really not very, very good. And I would always recommend to coaches and athletes and scientists forget that idea that this is a waste of, a waste of effort if you push in another direction than perpendicular. Because from a mechanical point of view, of course, people are right. Having a force perpendicular to the crank would be optimal. But the interaction of the human system with the bike system is such that this is not giving you the best performance. And so we have to think about biomechanics, but this is biomechanics and not engineering and not just mechanics where you have a motor whose force is independent of the force direction, unfortunately, 
that's not the case in human athletes. So what I wanted to say here about the force length relationship is that first of all, it derives directly from the cross bridge model and the cross bridge thinking. I think it's important to realize that. And I think it's important for sports where the working range can be selected, like in cycling, for example, where you can uh, adjust your seat tight and your crank cranks and so on. So you can work where you can define where on the force length relationship you would like to work based on how you set up your bike. And it's important for sports where the direction of force application matters. So in what position you push becomes very important. Uh, many years ago, I did a, a little study on shot putting, and there is that's also important for the force direction, because if a shot putter, a good shot putter, releases the shot at about two and a half meters height and throws world record about 23 meters, then the optimal trajectory would be about 43.5 degrees of a release angle. But shot put world records are achieved by throwing the shot somewhere between 35 and 37 degrees and not 43 and a half degrees. And why is that? Because at 35 or 37 degrees, the force that you can exert, the impulse that you can exert on the shot is much bigger than the one that you can exert at 43 and a half degrees. And therefore, the optimal trajectory of the shot, which would be at 43 and a half degrees, is not optimal because the force and the impulse that you can create in that direction again, through the human system, through the shock cooker, is not as good. And there's many, many situations in sport where athletes do something that seems mechanically not good and people try to correct it, but within the human system and the system interacting with the shot or the bicycle or the rowing or and so on, it's actually optimal for how they do that, or very often it is, maybe not always. So let me talk about very briefly about some considerations on the force velocity relationship. So the force velocity relationship is this relationship where we have force as a function of the velocity. And here we talk about the velocity of shortening only. And when you now take uh, this force velocity relationship and you multiply each of the points on this force velocity relationship, so the velocity is the corresponding force, then you can get the maximum power output of a muscle by multiplying force times velocity. And when you do that, you get this uh, inverted U-shaped curve that is zero here because you have no force anymore, and it's zero here because your velocity is zero, and then this term, of course, becomes zero. But somewhere in the middle, or more precisely, at about 30 or 35% of the maximum velocity of shortening, your power output of a muscle is maximal. And not only that, magically, at that power output, at that velocity, the efficiency of the muscles tends to be the highest as well. So you have the pa highest power output and the biggest efficiency of a muscle at about a shortening velocity of 30 or 35 percent of its maximum velocity of shortening. And therefore, of course, in many power sports, if this is the power velocity relationship, in many sports, that require power, you would like to work here at this optimal velocity of shortening to maximize the power output and therefore the work over a given amount of distance or the impulse over a given amount of time that you can exert. And so we looked at it, this in a variety of different sports. And one of them is, again, cross-country skiing, where we looked at the double polling action. And we looked at the force output in double polling at different speeds of skiing and we wanted to see whether or not this gross movement, what we call a functional force velocity relationship, whether this functional force velocity relationship of an entire movement, whether or not it is similar to what we would expect from a muscle so that we get this hyperbolic shape uh, of, the, of the relationship. And the reason why this is important is because, uh, or, or the reason why we've chosen double polling is because double polling in the last 20 years has become the predominant propulsive mechanism in cross-country skiing in the classic technique, in the skating techniques, it's become absolutely incredibly important. And therefore, understanding it has become incredibly important in that particular sport. And so here we have, um, here we have a, a, a cross-country uh, skier and double pouring. And you can see that the propulsion comes all through the poles because the skis don't have any friction 
and therefore you cannot apply any force there through the through the ski. But of course, you also see this is not only an arm and pull action, but the whole body is involved. And believe it or not, people uh, ski lopets only in this style. And the longest one that I know is the Birkebeiner in Norway, where people ski 92 kilometers for three, four, five, six hours only doing this particular movement. So we were interested in checking uh, what the force velocity relationship of this functional movement is. So we put people on a treadmill and had them ski at a variety of different speeds and double polling as shown here. We measure the kinematics, we measure the forces in the poles and the electromyographical activity and essentially everything you can think of. What I'm showing you here is uh, the impulse rather than the force as a function of the speed of skiing for two different techniques, uh, what we call the one skate and two skate technique in skate skiing. And it's not really important at this point what they are, but the interesting thing is that the curves are slightly different. And the other interesting thing is that they both have a slightly hyperbolic shape, like you would expect from a muscle. So this seems to be very similar to what we would expect from a muscle. If you now calculate the power output here on the vertical axis as a function of the speed of skiing, then you see that uh, uh, here, this data point at 18 kilometers per hour gave us the maximum power output for these elite skiers that we measured. And then it's important to realize that elite skiers normally in a long race, in a 30 or 50 kilometer race, they ski at about 30, 28 or 30 kilometers per hour. So already about 25 or 30 percent of the power output is lost because they are skiing at this faster speed. And then the question becomes, how might we potentially help that? How might we be able to bring that up and modify things so that we could take more advantage of the power output that people have available. And so the one thing is you can change the technique. And as I showed in the one skate and the two skate technique, the power curves and the force velocity curves are slightly different. And as you can see, the two skate technique uh, gives you more power at very short, uh, slow speeds and at very high speeds, but at intermediate speeds between about 15 and 25 kilometers per hour, the one skate technique gave uh, these elite skiers more power output. And not only that, at these intermediate speeds, the efficiency was also better in the one skate technique compared to the two skate technique. And so when people ski slow on a very steep uphill, they'll use the two skate technique. Then when they are on a flat case where they go between 15 or 25 kilometers per hour, slight uphill, then they use the one skate technique. And then when they go really fast or in a sprint action, then they go back to the two skate technique because of the power output available to them and because of the efficiency that's associated with the power output. And then you ask yourself, well, why is that? Because they ski exactly at the same speed, why would we get different uh, outputs? And the, the, the simple answer is because the frequency of polling is different. So in the one skate technique, you pull on every step. And in the two skate technique, you only have a double pole action every stride. And so here, at, uh, you have a polling frequency from the very slow speed of about 48 polling cycles per minute up to 75 polling cycles per minute at very fast speeds. Whereas in the two skate technique, you're much lower. You go from 32 to about 51. So at a very, very high speed, uh, you have a polling frequency that's 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 the same as for the one skate technique at a very slow at a very slow speed. So, in other words, by changing the technique that you're using, you can affect the frequency of polling, and that has an effect on the force velocity and the power velocity relationships. But but not only that, there is other considerations, and one of these considerations is the pole length. Because we hypothesize that if you change the pole lengths, that that is related to the frequency of movement. So like shifting gears on a bicycle, you could use a longer or a shorter pole to, pull, to have a higher or lower frequency that then would affect the force velocity relationship. And the reason for that is because we thought if you have a longer pole, then your contact phase would be longer and your recovery phase would be longer. And therefore, your polling frequency would be lower. But of course, if you ski on an uphill and you need to have a certain amount of power output, then of course, your impulse 
per cycle would have to be higher with a, with a longer pole. And that's exactly what we hypothesized. A lower frequency of movement is decreased with the metabolic cost because turning muscles on and off is really metabolically costly. So if you turn a muscle on 30 times per second or 60 times per second makes a big difference. And also the rate of force development costs you energy when you, uh, when you have a high rate of force development, like in a high frequency movement, that costs a lot of metabolic energy compared to when you have a relatively slow rate of force development. And therefore we thought that skiing with longer poles might be more efficient because of the lower frequency uh, and all the associated muscle mechanical effects on efficiency that that has. So we took some elite skiers in uh, from Canada and we had them ski with their preferred pole lengths and then plus minus five centimeters and plus minus 10 centimeters. And they did that at a 2% incline at a velocity that was just below their anaerobic threshold. And here we have the contact time as a function of the pole lengths. And as you can see, as expected, when the pole length gets longer, then we have this trend of an increasing contact time, which is exactly what you would expect. And then the polling frequency would decrease with increasing polling lengths from here, from about when you extend this line from about 49 down to about 41 polling cycles per minute. And that then, of course, requires that the propulsive impulse is higher with the longer poles because the total impulse that you need to, to, do, to give to the skiers on a two, two degree uphill would be the same. So if you have less cycles, then the individual cycle needs to have a higher propulsive force. And then the question becomes, what is now better? What is more efficient when you have a high propulsion, a high impulse and a lower frequency or a low impulse and a higher frequency? And as we expected, the, the longer poles are more efficient. So here we have the oxygen uptake for this given speed of skiing, and it clearly has a downhill slope that's highly statistically significant. So longer poles allow for a more efficient scheme. And so then the question, of course, is why do people not do that? But here's the conclusion. Increasing pole lengths is associated with decreased cost of transport and an increased efficiency. And that's likely due to the decreased activation, deactivation requirements, and the decreased rate of force development with the long poles compared to the short poles. And therefore, the increased metabolic demand that you have due to the increased impulse per cycle is more than offset by the slower movement frequency with the long poles compared to the short poles. And as I mentioned before, why not use super long poles? And of course, Somebody had that idea, Gundeswan, the Olympic gold medal winner in 1988 in the 50 kilometer. He came to the world championships in 1985 in Seyfeld with only one pole that was really long in a classic race. And nobody could keep up with him in the training runs. And so two or three days before the world championships, the International Ski Federation got together and they immediately changed the rules about the poles. They said, you're not allowed to ski with one pole you have to have two poles, and not only that, both poles have to be equal lengths and shorter than your body height. And that's where the rules came from about pole lengths in cross-country skiing. And as many of you know, in October 2017, the pole length was further restricted in classic skiing to 83%. So disadvantaging skiers in using the double pole action really in an efficient way and using the poles in the most efficient way but there are um, certain technical reasons why the uh, International Ski Federation did not allow that. But anyway, uh, like in many sports, they don't allow you to do it the fastest possible way by imposing rules, which of course happens in javelin throwing, in swimming, in, in many, many sports that happens where the performance of athletes are restricted by the rules of the game. So, Anyway, what I wanted to say here about the force velocity relationship is that the maximal power output occurs at about 35% of the maximum velocity of shortening, and that the functional force velocity relationship uh, looks very similar or has a similar char characteristic 
uh, in cross-country skiing, double poling, like in a single muscle. And many other people have done this in other sports as well. Uh, and so have we, for example, in cycling, here's a very old paper from Tony Sargent in cycling 1981, where he shows this very nice relationship between the pedaling rate shown here. So pedaling rate is high here and low there. And here is the crank torque that can be produced. And when the pedaling rate is really high, then the crank torque is really low. And when the pedaling rate is low, then the crank, then, then the crank torque is really high. And then somewhere in the middle here, you have an optimal length. And some of these functional force velocity relationships, like in cycling, have been shown to be more linear rather than hyperbolic, like the one that I showed you and the one that we normally expect from the muscle. So I'm going to come to the end of my talk here. What, what did I want to talk about today? Well, I wanted to give an, an idea about the structure of muscle and how the structure of muscle and how fibers are incorporated into a volume of muscle is very important in the characteristics in how much force it can produce, how much the excursion is, and what the work capacity of the muscle is. I also talked about the force length and the force velocity relationship and wanted to show how they depend uh, on the uh, cross bridge theory and how these are related and how these properties are important in understanding. The muscle properties, uh, you know, they affect the, capaci the capacity to produce uh, muscle force. And that's, that's incredibly important, I think, in many sports where you can use this distinctly to your advantage. So you know what the force lengths, you know what the force velocity properties of muscles are, and then you use them to your advantage by supplying longer poles to steers, by having people uh, pedal at a different frequency, by not having them push the pedal perpendicular to crank, and many, many other examples. The interesting thing, and this is my last uh, sentence here that I wanted to get across, but the interesting thing to me always is that there is a lot of people doing muscle mechanics research, and there's a lot of people doing sport biomechanics research, but there's very few people looking at muscle mechanics in the context of sport. And I always try to encourage young people and uh, that start their career to maybe consider doing that more uh, than, than it is done now. Look at muscle mechanics in the context of sport, because I think you can learn a lot. And I think it's going to be tremendously useful for sport applications as well. So with this, I would like to thank uh, Antonio Duarte and Pedro once more. Uh, thank you for having me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Hi, hello. Hello. Well, thank you very much uh, also for the quite interesting um, presentation. Um, I, I, we have uh, some questions from, from, the, from the audience. So Jose Praia um, asked you uh, about uh, your study on the, on the force length uh, in cycling. Uh, why not include force length pedal rotation starting at uh, 210 degrees till 330 degrees? Uh, so, so why not include the recovery phase as well? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I guess the, the, the re well, we have actually measured it, the, the, the fascicle lengths for the entire, the entire duration of the, the crank cycle. But in this particular study, we looked at fascicle length changes and, um, and electromyographical activities and tried to estimate forces from that for the, for the power phase, for the, for the extensor muscle, the hip extensors, knee extensors, and, uh, and, the plantar, and the plantar flexor muscles. And so in the recovery phase, the muscles that we are looking at were essentially uh, quiescent and they were not activated. And so they would just go through the normal fascicle length changes that they were, but uh, you know, in the in the recovery phase, uh, the the vastus lateralis, for example, is turned off, not producing any force. And we were primarily interested in what happens to the muscle when they contribute actively to the power phase. That's why we didn't 
well, we actually looked at them at, at that phase as well, but that's why I didn't talk about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was, uh, to all the, the, the people that are listening, uh, if you want to place any question, please use the chat and we will quickly uh, address your, your questions and, and ask Walter about it. Um, concerning the, your, the presentation you, you, you made and, and uh, one of the, the areas where uh, a lot of people that are um, on the, uh, assisting or uh, are interested is in, in adaptation to, to strength training, for instance. And one of the um, issues that we discuss uh, several times already, uh, even uh, when you give us some help on the on the, in a work that uh, one of our PhD students and colleagues did, is uh, how do um, length uh, how do muscle adapt to different types of of, of training. And in case in cycling, uh, if you remember, we had a study comparing uh, sprinters and, and, and elite uh, cyclists. And we find out that it looks like to have to, to, to uh, that uh, the different type of, of uh, muscle uh, excursion uh, is associated with an adaptation in, in, fib in fascicle length, at least when we study that. So, uh, and it's still a big discussion on uh, how muscle and tendon adapts uh, to the different types of training, uh, varying excursion, uh, the, uh, training at different speeds, and, and particularly I, I saw that you had some ideas on uh, stretching, shortening cycle. And uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? And probably on this last um, idea of the stretching, shortening cycle. Uh, sometimes people uh, make a confusion between the fan force enhancement uh, or, or the side the uh, stretching shortening cycle with force enhancement with lengthening uh, on the time history dependent uh, result. So, uh, can you can you chat a little bit about both uh, ideas of the muscle adaptation to different types of of strength training and training itself, uh, and and also how the specific issue of uh, of uh, forced enhancement uh, length, uh, with lengthening um, could, it's a difficult subject to introduce, introduce in the, when we look at sports, but uh, uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? At, sure, your, yeah. at your discretion. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> I've got a very long question. I'm gonna try to be uh, no, pretty short, but let, let, me, let me talk about adaptation first. Uh, I, I think most people would agree that muscles are very good uh, at adapting to what they are asked to do. And uh, on several studies that we have done, I guess the very, very first one was between runners and cyclists. We showed fairly convincingly, I think, that they have uh, very different uh, knee extensor muscles. We look very particularly at the rectus femoris there. And the reason for that being that in cycling, that muscle is used in a, in, a, in a continuously shortened, in a chronically shortened position. And then elite cyclists sit on the bike for, you know, four, six, eight hours every day and chronically in this shortened position. And that then changes where the force length properties are and where you're strong with that particular muscle and where you're weak. And the runners uh, are, are the other way around. And we have also looked at volleyball players and dancers and swimmers and the adaptations in muscles. And it's quite clear that muscles adapt to the requirements that are put on them. And that's why I always like to say, because then all those people ask me, well, what about triathletes that run and cycle and swim? And my answer always is that I'm going to bet a lot of money that no triathlete, no world-class triathlete that trains all three events will ever be able to break the world record in the 10K run, for example. 
because the muscles are not made for running. They are made for something in between. So I'm a very firm believer in, 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 in adaptation. And in many animal studies, it has been shown quite nicely that when you um, put a muscle, when, when you put a joint into a cast where some muscles are elongated and other muscles are shortened, that you will get an adaptation of the sarcomere number. There's some very old work by Tabari and Tardieu and Goldspink and many other people 30, 40 years ago that have shown very, very nicely that you keep a muscle elongated chronically, it will get more sarcomeres. You have a muscle that is shortened chronically, it will lose sarcomeres. And then that increase or decrease in sarcomere number will then determine where in the functional range you reach the optimal lengths and therefore where the force length relationship is and how you use the muscle uh, within the force length relationship for cycling or running or jumping or whatever, whatever you do. The second thing is the uh, stretch shortening cycle. And uh, there have been, of course, uh, a variety of different theories why you have increased force in a stretch shortening cycle. Uh, initially, a lot of people thought it was due to the enhancement of activation that the stretch reflex response uh, pr provides a certain activation of the muscle that otherwise is not possible. That has essentially been disproven because you can get a very beautiful, um, you know, uh, increased uh, you know, stretch shortening effect in an isolated fiber or in an isolated muscle where you don't have any, any feedback where, where the activation is nicely controlled. Um, and then other people have argued that it is due to uh, primarily due to the tendon and the elastic elements in series in the muscle. And again, when you then take uh, isolated fibers or myofibers and you do stretch shortening cycle where you have absolutely minimal to no series elasticity in a tendon or anything, you still get a big stretch shortening uh, enhancement effect. And recently, uh, people like Wolfgang Seibel and Atsu, uh, Atsuki Fukutani and so have very much argued that potentially the, um, the stretch shortening effect might be associated with a tightening recoil so that you get an increased force in tightening during the stretch that then is immediately given back. And, and so some people would argue now that tightening might potentially play a fairly big role in that. But I think the jury is still out, uh, but I think it's fair to say that it's not only based on reflex activation that's increased, and it's fairly safe to say it's not just due to the, to the serious elasticity, but that there's something else that plays a contributing factor, and maybe, maybe tight and elasticity might be one of them. Thank you very much, Walter. It's, it's, um, it's a challenge also to try to, to study that in the macro level. Uh, do you have any ideas on how can someone try to you know, uh, ascertain the participation of Titan in, in, in a macro level effort? Because uh, that's yeah. a strong challenge, I think. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I think uh, 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 people like Atsuki Fukutani have done that to a certain degree that used, you know, that did a series of experiments uh, recently on, on single fiber preparation where he, uh, you know, did experiments where he completely controlled the activation, where he had no serious elasticity. And then he did the typical experiments, you know, where he had a stretch and an immediate shortening, or he had an isometric contraction and then a shortening and compared what the stretch shortening effect is. And then also did a variety of studies where he stretched and then held a little bit and then shortened and did these type of experiments to kind of elucidate whether or not um, the force enhancement nice. caused by Titan might potentially play a role and has made uh, what I would argue a reasonably strong argument that that probably Titan plays a role. But as I said, I think, you know, uh, uh, to really to really nail that down on the molecular level is, is, is a bit of a different question. <clears throat> okay, so we are uh, arriving to the end of our of our time. I would like to thank you very much, Walter, for a very uh, interesting and very clear presentation, like always. One of the things that I admire most is the absolutely clarity of your presentations, even when you talk about very complex uh, subjects. So thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Thank, thank you, Antonio. You. It was a pleasure.
Thank you as well, Pedro. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Very nice talk. Great talk. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Walker. Welcome. Yeah, Andrew, actually, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here and uh, have a good rest of the conference. Okay. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thanks we a lot. will be inspired by your fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Bye-bye. Bye, Walter. Thank you very much. Thank you.